What's up, Wisecrack? Jared here. My love for the original Matrix is no secret, but I can't deny that I found the last two films pretty baffling. You might have seen our previous videos covering what went wrong with my favorite franchise, but given the announcement of a fourth Matrix film, I wanted to look at the series with fresh eyes. This was driven by one specific comment from Lana Wachowski. In a Variety article announcing the new installment, she said, Many of the ideas Lily and I explored 20 years ago about our reality are even more relevant now. What does she mean by that? Is it because robots are stealing our jobs? Are dusters coming back in style? Is Elon Musk talking about being trapped in a simulation again? While all these might hold some kernel of truth, especially the part about how cool dusters are, we think we figured out what the Wachowskis were trying to do and why it may resonate today more than ever. Like the title of the Rage Against the Machine song that closes the film, the original is about waking up about seeing past the wool that has been pulled over our eyes, of shattering the grand illusion. While it might have been a little obscured by weird rave scenes, we can better understand the latter two films with the question of, what's next? Once we've become awakened to the true reality behind the lies of the world, what other dangers lurk behind the red pill? And how does this speak to today? Let's find out in this Wisecrack edition on The Matrix. Is real freedom possible? And as always, spoilers ahead for all three Matrix films. But first, a very brief recap. The original Matrix follows hacker Neo as he learns that the world is a digital illusion and that machines have created a vast simulation in order to use humanity as a renewable energy source. Neo joins the human resistance in the real world and, after some self-reflection, realizes his destiny as the One, a prophesied super badass who will use his powers to free humanity from the Matrix. In The Matrix Reloaded, no such liberation has happened because it turns out the One is nothing more than an inevitable anomaly in the system that the machines have planned for. In other words, Neo's exceptionalism is just part of the greater project to keep the human race enslaved. At the end of the film, Neo makes a choice to avoid perpetuating the vicious cycle of human oppression and risks the lives of all humans to save his love, Trinity. He also somehow has powers in the real world now. In Revolutions, we see Neo's choice resulting in the Matrix deteriorating at the hands of Agent Smith, so a now blinded Neo who can still see… something strikes a bargain with the machines. He will sacrifice himself to destroy Agent Smith in exchange for liberating all the humans from the Matrix who want to be. What about the others? What others? The ones that want out. Obviously, they will be freed. Before we get into the muddled message of the second and third films, let's revisit one of the most obvious and well-tread interpretations of the original film. In this interpretation, Neo's journey from the green-tinged and illusory world of the Matrix into the dystopian real world is a version of Plato's allegory of the cave. To summarize, a person spends their entire life trapped inside a cave where all they see is shadows on a wall in front of them, but because this is all they've ever known, they take the shadows to be the one true reality. One day, that person, like Neo, is set free to discover the reality behind the shadows. For Plato, that person was a philosopher, and hence would help others free themselves from the cave. So for Neo, the cave is the Matrix, and he's let out by Morpheus. You take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. It's all more techno-dystopian than Plato could have ever imagined, but for both Plato's cave dweller and Neo, the transition to the actual real world isn't easy. For a lifelong cave dweller, the sun-soaked world is blinding. For Neo, robots are trying to kill him and food tastes bad. Plato's allegory of the cave has inspired countless philosophers for thousands of years, but there's something uniquely timely about it today. Now more than ever, cultural and political movements seem obsessed with stepping out of the cave of one's imposed ignorance. Whether that's using the Matrix's own red pill as a metaphor for one's awakening, or staying woke, people with radically different politics frame their movement in terms of pulling back the curtain of social domination. Welcome to the desert of the real. In the original film, it's hackers that are presented as the brave souls who are able to use their technical abilities to identify and exploit the digital cracks in their false reality. And while in the 90s the internet was still in its early stages, you've got mail. The feeling that the right subreddit or Google search can set you free from your ideological shackles has become commonplace. So if the original Matrix film tried to wake us up from our various dream states by asking us to question our realities, how did the sequels try to push this a step further by getting us to wake up again? 
Or in Christopher Nolan's terms, how can we wake up from a dream that's already taking place within another dream? Besides being pushed into a bathtub of water, obviously. The Matrix Reloaded explores the limits of this initial level of wokeness by showing how larger systems of control are often designed to limit our freedom, and in particular, how these systems can control us via the guise of freedom. We're first introduced to the central conflict of the film, the tension between freedom and control, during Neo's late night chat with Counselor Haman about the relationship between seemingly free human beings and seemingly determined machines. Down here, sometimes I think about all those people still plugged into the Matrix, and when I look at these machines, I, I can't help thinking that in a way, we are plugged into them. While Neo is quick to point out that humans are ultimately in control as they can simply hit the off switch, Counselor Haman points out the opposite truth, that if they did turn the machines off, the residents of Zion would no longer have air or water, and they would die. But we control these machines, they don't control us. Of course not. How could they? The idea is pure nonsense, but it does make one wonder just what is control? The appearance of absolute human freedom is a thin veil over an underlying dependence on machines. This dichotomy goes even further when Neo meets the Architect, who informs him that this is actually the sixth time he's had a meeting with an iteration of Neo. How is this possible? Well, because Neo isn't as free as he thought. He's actually a necessary feature of the Matrix itself a systemic anomaly. You are the eventuality of an anomaly which, despite my sincerest efforts, I have been unable to eliminate from what is otherwise a harmony of mathematical precision. He is a necessary part of the very system he's working to destroy. This is very heavy in its implications, as the Wachowskis seem to be implying that even after we wake up from the various illusions and ideologies, we still might be caught up in a higher level system of control. And unfortunately, Plato's allegory of the cave is of little use here. Sometimes raging against the machine is exactly what the machine wants. And if we want to understand why, we need to look to philosopher Karl Marx. Now already the ideas of Marx map pretty easily onto the matrix. Marx argued that society had two fundamental classes, the workers of the world and the owners of capital, the people who had the actual factories and machines to make stuff who were, in his view, vampires living off the life force of workers. Tweak this a little bit and you've got literal machines enslaving humans to live off their bodily energy while the humans get to dream of eating steak. We should note here that the Wachowskis thought they were making a movie about the philosophy of Jean Baudrillard, a philosopher who, while heavily influenced by Marx, greatly diverged from his ideas. In particular, Baudrillard thought that while production a la Marx's worker and factory owners was a useful category in analyzing industrial society, the consumer revolution of the late 20th century made it necessary to shift to the category of consumption. To oversimplify, modern capitalism is not so much defined by production lines as it is by Disney lines. But they got it kind of wrong. Baudrillard himself said that the Wachowskis' use of his work stemmed mostly from misunderstandings. He thought the Wachowskis were missing the point in large part because they got trapped in a Marxist line of thinking. Marx, like Plato, thought that most people experienced an obscured version of reality. But Marx's word for it was ideology, which gets a lot more complicated. But importantly, whereas Baudrillard thought there was no deeper reality behind the spectacle of modern capitalism, no way to escape our metaphorical matrix, Marx thought that there was hope for piercing the veil. Marx thought one of the symptoms of ideology was a kind of upside-down world. Whereas many would argue that ideas, politics, and culture are things that drive our material reality, Marx argued that it was the reverse. Our material reality was what determined our ideas, politics, and culture. To put it simply, if you thought your boss's respect for timeliness and honesty shaped how work was done, you have it backwards. How work is done shapes our need for timeliness and honesty. For Marx, the foundation of a society is formed by relations of labor and production. That's called the base. So in an industrial society, the base is the production of consumer goods, which requires the distinction between employees and employers or owners and workers. In the matrix, that base is the need to extract energy from human batteries for whatever it is they're trying to build or do. The place where ideology rests, he calls the superstructure. It's composed of things like culture, religion, politics, and rituals. In industrial society, the superstructure helps reinforce base relations, like the virtue of hard work getting you through the day as you monotonously tighten your thousandth nut for the day. Or in the canon of this bizarre Powerade commercial, your craving of electrolytes to fuel your robot overlords. The point is to keep generating all that energy. Your body needs to be replenished. So, drink your Powerade. 
We have quotas to meet. This superstructure reproduces itself to perpetuate the base conditions. However, it's not until the Matrix Revolutions that Neo is able to fully grasp that the superstructure is not just the Matrix. If human ideology is dictated by the means of machine production, so is machine ideology. He meets three programs in the train station named Ramakandra, Kamala, and their daughter Sati, and learns that the war oppresses machines too, as they are trying to help their daughter evade deletion. I love my daughter very much. I find it to be the most beautiful thing I have ever seen. But where we are from, that is not enough. Every program that is created must have a purpose. If it does not, it is deleted. Therefore, the Matrix isn't just a system in the sense that it's a computer program. The superstructure births the idea that humans and machines must be perpetually at war to ensure that the material base of energy production goes untouched. So, in an ideological sense, that is the Matrix. This brings us back to the tension between freedom and control. As in Marx's analysis, certain types of freedom are just superstructural illusions that enable a deeper level of control in terms of an economic base. Remember that Neo's entire existence, including his role as the one who will lead a rebellion to free humans from machine control, is a necessary part of the system itself. But the Matrix argues it is when one thinks they are free from ideology that they are most immersed in it. I'm going to hang up this phone, and then I'm going to show these people what you don't want them to see. I'm going to show them a world without you. A world without rules and controls, without borders or boundaries. If we thought Neo threatening his machine overlords and flying off into the sky as Rage Against the Machine plays was peak rebellion, we were sorely mistaken. In the architect's control room, he learns he was actually doing precisely what previous versions of his code had already done five times previously, what was already pre-planned. The function of the One is now to return to the source, allowing a temporary dissemination of the code you carry, reinserting the Prime program. And isn't this precisely what's happening to us when we both consume and produce ideas and content on digital platforms? As each time we tweet or repost an article that exposes some societal injustice or buried knowledge, we are providing more data for algorithms that are figuring out how to better serve us ads and sell us goods and services. And unlike Neo, these illusions are taking place right within our own world. We're even creating our own myths to avoid acknowledging how wrapped up we are in these systems. For example, the stories about people's devices listening to them and serving them ads on Facebook and Instagram. This is, of course, false, but the truth is more horrifying, which is that algorithms have done such a good job of constructing data sets about each of us that they can accurately predict our desires. Which brings us back to the tension between control and freedom. Are we really free when we exist in digital spaces, or are we just the unknowing cogs in a digital marketing machine? The one was never meant to end anything. It was all another system of control. And while Neo's Matrix power while seeing gold shit in the third film still doesn't make sense, maybe the Wachowskis were trying to go for something like this. His powers derive from his ability to see behind the final curtain, the ideology that dictates the human machine war. The ability to break through an all-encompassing ideological system ends up being more valuable than the ability to dodge bullets. And maybe this is why Lana Wachowski has said that the themes of the Matrix films are more relevant now than ever, as we live in a digital culture that is obsessed with becoming woke to cultural injustice and red-pilling their way to higher forms of knowledge. But all too often, this attempt to wake up from the dream is just a higher function of the very ideological structure we think we're escaping. If there's a consistent theme from these films that applies to this contemporary problem, it seems to be the imperative to constantly interrogate ideological systems with the understanding that the moment we think ourselves free from ideology is likely when we are the most fully immersed in it. So, will the next Matrix introduce us to some new illusion we've been indoctrinated into? Will it explain some of the shortcomings of the trilogy? Honestly, I'm just really, really hoping it's good. In the meantime, we'll be trying our best to remember that even if we don't have sockets in our spines, that we might be plugged into ideological power structures without even knowing it. So, good luck in staying awake, and as always, thanks for watching, guys. Peace.